Welcome to lecture four for chemistry 312, radiochemistry. This lecture, we're going to talk about alpha decay. The readings for alpha decay are covered in chapter three of nuclear and radiochemistry and chapter four of modern nuclear chemistry. This lecture is going to cover energetics of alpha decay. In other words, the energy related to the decays. We're going to get information from the theory of alpha decay as it's developed between energetics and half-lives. We're going to introduce a term called hindrance factors. We're also going to talk about heavy particle radioactivity. In other words, decay of something not only uh, that's uh, a charged particle that's larger than a helium nucleus. We'll introduce the concept that some isotopes have a very, very small branching of a decay of something like carbon-12. And then we'll talk about proton radioactivity, in other words, proton decay. And there's a, re a range on the chart of the nuclides, the proton drip line, and we'll discuss the emission of protons from isotopes. As we presented in our very first lecture on the history of modern nuclear physics and radioactive decay, Ernest Rutherford and his team identified a positively charged particle being emitted from the nucleus. The helium-4 nucleus was based on observed emission bands. And so from this point, it was clear that a particle of two protons, two neutrons, was coming out of the nucleus. Now, the energetics of alpha decay, their energies range from 2 to 9 MeV. Originally, they were thought to be monoenergetic. However, fine structure was uh, discovered where the alpha decay energies can vary. And as we'll see, what this means is that alpha decay, when it goes to a daughter state, can decay to different levels in the daughter nucleus. The levels, those energy levels differences are based on the differences on the alpha decay. So you can get information on the energy level differences from the differences in the alpha decay. And those will often be accompanied by gamma emissions. So for instance, if an alpha decays to a energetic daughter state, that'll be accompanied by a gamma emission that will also be a measurement of that energetic state. And our general trend that we have for alpha decay, as we discussed earlier, is that a parent decays to a daughter. It loses two protons. The A changes by four because two neutrons are also emitted. They're emitted as this alpha particle, and we have this Q value. An example of an isotope that undergoes alpha decay is shown here, Cyborgium-263. It decays. It loses two protons two neutrons, so it goes to Rutherfordium. The A reduces by four, so it goes from 263 to 259. And there's a helium nucleus that's also emitted as the alpha particle. The energy, this Q value, we're going to find is really the sum of the alpha energy and the recoiling nucleus energy. And here's an example of that fine structure as we discussed with alpha decay. So you see here, here's an example of a alpha decay spectrum that one could take for the decay of thorium-228. We see that there's a few different alpha decay energies observed. And I want to point out that this is log counts versus channel number. The channel number is directly correlated with energy. So we see that there is one peak that dominates but a few peaks that can be observed at relatively low intensities. This relates to the decay scheme where the bulk of the thorium-228 decays to the ground state of the radium-224. There are certain transitions that uh, decay to uh, higher level states of the daughter. There'll be less alpha energy, and they're accompanied by gamma decay, and that sum of the gamma and the alpha equals that entire energy drop. So the alpha decay energies can vary for the same isotope. And we know that when we look at the chart of the nuclides, we have different alpha decay energies listed for a given isotope. There are over 350 alpha emitting nuclei. And as I showed here, these alpha decay energies can be used to develop decay schemes. Fundamentally, all nuclei that are greater than 150 mass are thermodynamically unstable against alpha emission. 
That means they have a positive Q value. However, uh, the probability of some of those decays are rather small compared to competition from beta. So you generally see alpha with uh, isotopes that are greater than 210. This isn't completely true. As we see here, their energy ranges from about 2 MeV to almost 12 MeV, where neodymium-144 is a very low energy alpha emitter in the lanthanides, and polonium-212 metastable is a very high energy. We're also going to see a correlation between half-life and decay energy, where the neodymium half-life is almost 10 to the 30th times longer than the polonium-212. And what we're going to find out is that, generally speaking, the shorter the half-life, the higher the alpha decay energy. There are some trends that can be observed with the Q-value energetics for alpha decay. One is that the Q value generally increases with A. So if we look at all the isotopes together and we increase A, we see that there's a general trend that as A goes up, the Q value increases. However, um, this is not generally true for a given isotope. If I look at a given isotope, for instance, the lead here or the bismuth here, plutonium here, as I increase the A for a given isotope, the Q value generally decreases. There's also some shell effects that we see with this Q value. We see peaks uh, at N of 126. We also see that there's um, alpha decay near uh, the 82 neutron closed shell, which is found in the lanthanides. We get a crease, an increase in the Q value there since we get an increase in the alpha decay energy. The alpha half-life decreases so that we can start to see some competition between alpha decay and other modes of decay. There's also some short-lived alpha emitters near doubly magic tin 100, and you can examine this on the chart of the nuclides. Look at some of the isotopes that are listed here. And alpha emitters have also been identified by the proton drip line above A of 100. And the proton drip line is that part of the chart of the nuclides, which is right at the very edge, the left-hand edge, so the very, very light isotopes of, um, uh, of, of the elements. And A above 100, if you inspect that area of the chart of the nuclides, you'll see some, uh, pro some alpha emitters. The alpha decay energetics allows us to calculate the Q value and the alpha decay energy for a given isotope. We know that the Q value often ex exceeds the alpha decay energy. And this is due to the fact that the Q value is the total energy of the system. So it's the kinetic energy of both the alpha particle and the daughter. We have a relationship where the momenta are going to be equal in opposite directions for the kinetic energy, I um, mean, for the daughter and the alpha particle. So we can use this equation where mass times kinetic energy for the alpha is equal to mass times the kinetic energy of the daughter. We can rearrange this equation and we can solve for the kinetic energy of the daughter as a function of the mass of the alpha to kinetic energy of the alpha and the mass of the daughter. We can substitute this into the Q value equation and we get a relationship in which we have terms of the kinetic energy of the alpha, mass of the alpha, and the daughter. We can rearrange this, this is shown here, and we, find, we end up with a final relationship where we can say that the kinetic energy of the alpha particle is equal to the Q value times the mass of the daughter divided by the mass of the alpha particle plus the mass of the daughter. From this equation, we see that the bulk of the kinetic energy value is taken up by the alpha particle. So the Q value is often close to the alpha decay uh, energy. From the semi-empirical mass equation from alpha decay, we know that a, an emission of an alpha particle lowers the Coulomb energy of a nucleus. This increases the stability of heavy nuclei while not affecting the overall binding energy per nucleon because an alpha particle is emitted, and if you remember uh, from the figure of the uh, binding energy versus uh, a, alpha particles have very high binding energies. So we can use the calculations uh, that we discussed to evaluate um, Q values for reactions. So as an example here, if we wanted to evaluate the Q value 
of the decay of uranium-238 to thorium-234 plus an alpha. If we get the mass excesses of uranium-238, thorium-234, and an alpha particle, we can arrange this equation. We can see that the Q value is 4.27 MeV. Um, you know, then we can use this to plug into our equation here and calculate what the Q value, from the Q value, what is the alpha decay energy. We see that uh, the Q value is 4.27 and our alpha decay energy is 4.198 MeV. One interesting observation about these energetics is that the alpha particle energy is often less and often far less than the Coulomb barrier of the alpha particle and the daughter. So in other words, the energy that it takes for an alpha particle to leave the nucleus is often much, much less than the energy needed to push that uh, alpha particle into the daughter to reform the nucleus. And we can evaluate this by, the Q, by, by evaluating the Coulomb barrier. And here's our equation that we'll use for the Coulomb barrier. Two, because that'll, since we're using this solve for alpha, the Z of the alpha particles two, 2ZR 1.44 MeV. So we'll uh, rearrange this equation, plug in the values for uh, the particle that we're interested in. So let's look at this for uranium 238. The alpha particle Z is 2. For 238, the daughter would be uh, thorium, so we use a Z of 90. We put in the values 1.2 times a daughter to the one-third plus uh, helium nucleus to the one-third times 1.44 MeV Fermi. And what we get is a Coulomb barrier of 28 MeV. So this says the alpha decay energy, while it emits with, you know, on the order of 4 MeV, to reverse the reaction would take 28 MeV. So the alpha decay energies are small compared to the energy required for the reverse reaction. So this is uh, an idea that can be used to figure out what, it, how does this mechanism occur and how does the alpha particle leave the nucleus. As we discussed earlier, alpha particle emission can often uh, demonstrate fine structure. And this is due to the fact that uh, the alpha particle, during the decay, the parent can decay to an excited state of the daughter. And this is often due to the fact that the daughter nucleus and the parent nucleus spin in parity need to match up to a certain degree. So for instance, Californium-249, it goes to the ninth excited state of Curium-245 because that is the lowest lying state with the same parent spin and energy. So, and we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail so that we can understand why uh, certain isotopes have fine structure and certain don't. For instance, even even nuclei since their spin and parity is zero plus, will often decay to the ground state of the daughter because their spin and parity is zero plus, and the alpha particle it also has zero plus spin and parity. We can also observe long, something called long range alpha decay, which is really the decay from a metastable state to a ground state of the daughter. So for instance, polonium-212, that sits almost three MeV above the polonium, uh, excuse me, polonium-212M, it sits about 3 keV above the polonium-212 ground state. And it decays to the lead-208 uh, directly with an alpha particle of about 11.5 MeV. And what's interesting about lead-208 is the magic nuclear properties of lead-208 can help drive that ground state, um, that decay from the metastable state all the way to the ground state of the daughter. There are some systematics that can be observed from alpha decay, as we've already discussed. The Coulomb potential uh, has a way of accelerating the higher mass products out of the nucleus. And with a larger mass, it's often observed, so larger A's that decay, the daughter and alpha particle can start further apart within the nucleus. So that's another reason that this potential uh, exists, so that alpha decay occurs with higher A nuclei. One of the things that we can observe through alpha decay is some effects of the mass parabola from semi-empirical mass equations. This example is shown here where we can get alpha decay 
occurring and with accompanied beta decay. So as we see, as an example here, we get a decay from a higher state through alpha, and we can observe beta decay because while it's, once the isotope is on this mass parabola, it can go to the lowest state. The other thing we observe is we get areas where we can get branch decays, so where there's a probability of either a decay through beta or a decay through alpha. So this is why we can get branched decays within the uh, decay chains for uranium and thorium. Using what we've discussed, we can start thinking about how alpha decays occurs in the nucleus and develop alpha decay theory. The distance that the closest approach for a 4.2 MeV alpha particle can make to a thorium nucleus, so similar to this uranium-238 decay that we were discussing, is about 62 femtometers. So if we look here on this potential for a nucleus, the 4.2 MeV would get about this far and then be uh, repulsed by, Coulomb, by the Coulomb barrier. So the alpha particle shouldn't get anywhere near the nucleus. So if we look at the nuclear potential, the alpha particle would be sitting right about here on the order of 4 MeV above the ground state. And if I look at this from a classical component, the alpha particle should be completely trapped behind the nucleus. There's a barrier up here. Now, wave functions are only completely confined by infinitely high uh, energy barrier. So the energy potential, we need to go all the way up. We have a Coulomb potential, so it's a finite size. So this, there is the main component of a wave function that describes where the alpha particle can, be, can exist would be inside the barrier, but there's also a finite component that's going to be outside the barrier. So there's a probability of finding the alpha particle outside the barrier. And this is what we call in quantum mechanics tunneling. So the trapped particle has a component of the wave function outside the barrier potential. So there's a probability, however small, of it appearing outside um, this barrier. And there's a probability that it would go through this barrier. In fact, we can show that this probability of penetrating the barrier has to be related to the, the, to the decay probability. So we should be able to determine something about the decay constant related to this barrier. Now, higher energies are going to have a higher probability of tunneling through this barrier. And as an example, imagine that we have two different energies shown here, one here, one here. There's a component inside the, inside the potential nucleus is the same. The amount or the distance that these different energies would have to penetrate through the barrier is different. The higher energy has a shorter barrier potential, therefore it would have a higher probability of tunneling through that barrier. And this is why we see a relationship between a shorter half-life and a higher energy. Imagine if you were very close to the Coulomb barrier, you have a very small barrier to penetrate through, so the probability of penetrating the barrier would be very high. And that's the other thing that we see with this equation, is that we can determine when we talk about the Coulomb barrier, uh, from a mathematical point of view, this is what it uh, looks like when we describe the nuclear potential. So one of the manifestations of this model we just discussed is that the closer the particle energy is to the barrier, uh, the more likely the particle will penetrate that barrier. Also, a more energetic alpha particle will encounter the barrier more often. If we think about the kinetic energy, the mass would be the same, velocity would be greater for a more energetic particle. Fundamentally, the probability of penetrating a barrier is a consistent factor. The more times I hit the barrier, the more times I can sample that barrier, and the higher the probability in a given unit of time, I can will, will be the manifestation of penetrating that barrier. Since the particle is going faster, it'll hit the barrier more often in, this, in a given amount of time. So this goes also to drive the increase of probability of barrier penetration. Now, one theory uh, that's been developed from this is called the geiger nuttall law of alpha decay. And here's two examples of it. It's fundamentally the same figures, just plotted a little bit differently. And we see that there's definitely a relationship, and this is a log-log uh, type relationship, where we see that the log of the half-life is equal to two constants, A plus 
b divided by the square root of the q value. Now, the constant for any a and b are going to be dependent upon the z dependence. And one thing I want to show here is um, the figures, as we see, we have different z's, so different elements. And we also have the same thing here, but I want to point out that uranium-235 does not sit on this uranium line. And that's because not only do we need the same z, but these are all even, even isotopes. So if I take an equation that I derive for an even, even isotope, and I try to use it for an odd a isotope, I won't, uh, the odd a isotope will not fit on that equation. Now the simple relationship can describe data for alpha decay for over 20 orders of magnitude in decay constants or half-life. And what's observed is that a 1 MeV change in alpha decay energy can result in a change of about 10 to the fifth for the half-life. So we have this dependence on half-life and decay um, and Q value that uh, we've discussed earlier. The geiger nuttall relationship, as we discussed previously, is a very simple and straightforward model to describe alpha decay and uh, half-life. Now there's models that are available that can be more accurate and take into account closed shell information. An example is given here, the Hatsukawa model. And this can be, uh, obviously there's empirical fits here. There's corrections for how close or how far one away is from shell parameters. So this is Z dependence. But one thing about this model that's shown is that there's relationships between the daughter A, the Q value of the alpha, and the A of the daughter. So they're pretty straightforward relationships that are also reflected in the geiger nuttall law. So one theoretical description that can be used to try to universalize how alpha decay occurs is trying to break up the alpha decay into two factors. One factor is a rate in which an alpha particle appears at the ins in inside the nucleus. In other words, in order for the alpha particle to escape the nucleus, it has to be there in the first place. And then this, so we can call that factor this frequency factor. How often does that alpha particle appear in the nucleus? And then there's the second factor, which is, okay, once that alpha particle appears, what's the probability of it getting through the nucleus? So some sort of transmission factor, right? So this factor is here. We can call that P, the transmission factor. And taken together, we can take the transmission factor and the frequency factor to get something about the decay constant for alpha decay. Now we have an additional factor, this preformation factor of the alpha particle in the nucleus that can help us describe alpha decay theory in more detail. Unfortunately, we really have no clear way to calculate from first principles this preformation probability. We can use empirical data, and fundamentally the difference between the theoretical estimates and the observed emission rates can be used to evaluate what the preformation factor should be. So basically, we can use the preformation factor as a fit for our data. Now, we can use the velocity of the alpha particle as a way to determine how many times the alpha particle will impinge upon the barrier. And we know that um, we can use that as a frequency of how often the alpha particle will impinge upon the barrier. It's basically related to the velocity of the alpha particle, and it needs to, and if we can calculate the radius of the nucleus, and that we've already discussed how to do that. We take t twice the radius, that's the distance that the alpha particle would need to traverse, and that's on the order of femtometers. We can get information about the alpha velocity from the kinetic energy, and we can use one half mv squared. In all actuality, um, the, that's a lower limit for the velocity because uh, the particle, is, since it's moving in a potential well, the velocity could be greater. And what we find out is that the alpha particle can impinge a nuclear barrier on the order of 10 to the 21st times a second. So we can utilize this equation, which is shown here. There's some frequency is equal to the velocity divided by twice the radius. We can re relate this to the Q value, the Coulomb barrier, and this term mu, which winds up being the reduced mass. And this is just a function of the mass of the uh, alpha particle and the daughter.
Now, there's an equation that evaluates this called the Gamow equation, which is listed here. And this can be used to evaluate the decay constant for alpha decay. Um, we can determine that decay constant from the potential. Here's our nuclear potential. And fundamentally, we've got some energy here, T. The alpha particles at this energy, so what's the probability of it penetrating this barrier? That's all we're really interested in. And we get this equation that's listed here. And with the terms of this equation, it's a constant, 2 a mu, that's our reduced mass factor. We have R's, R1, R2. Well, those are just the distances that it needs to penetrate the barrier. So the R1 is here, R2 is here. So we integrate from those terms and these values here. Those are just our potential terms for the nucleus, where here's one energy potential, and T is the kinetic energy. So we can use this equation, use the square well potential, integrate and substitute. The equation comes out to be this term, where we get the decay constant is equal to a number of factors. The Z, the large Z here is the daughter, the small Z, is the alpha particle and we also have some other here, terms here t and b which are just functions of z the radius or we can talk about it in, two, in terms of the mass and the b and the radius so this calculation we just described with all the terms can actually be rearranged to evaluate the half-life you know, the half-life is log 2 divided by the decay constant, so we substitute those terms in. The decay constant is just this frequency factor of the probability. We discuss the Gamow term, which is shown here. So it's log 2 divided by this factor, e to the minus 2g. G is a Gamow factor. And what this rearranges to is something very familiar. Uh, it just shows the geiger nuttall relationship that Gamow uh, also predicted. These factors here are specific for a given nucleus, and if we derive the terms in log of the half-life is equal to two constants, these constants can be used to evaluate terms of the nucleus that are related to the Coulomb barrier and the Q value. Now one thing about these equations is that the calculated emission rates are typically um, larger than the observed rates, and what this means is that the observed half-lives are longer than predicted. Now this observed, this difference can be used to uh, evaluate a preformation factor. So if we think about it, this model can describe the decay of an alpha particle if the alpha particle always exists in the nucleus. The fact that the half-lives that are observed are longer than predicted gives us a factor that can say, well, what's the actual uh, probability of having this preformation factor in the nucleus? This prefor so the preformed alpha is a way of fixing the data so that our uh, calculations and observed data can match. And we just use the preformation factor as a fix to what we observed. And we can evaluate, evaluate the difference between calculated and measured half-life. And this figure is shown here for even-even um, even nuclei. So these tend to be ground state to ground state. The average preformation factor is about 10 to the minus 2. So if we say here, this, this is a ratio of the calculated to measured. And we can say, well, we can fix this data so it works by having a preformation factor of 10 to the minus 2. Now, everything we discussed related to the model really holds for even, even nuclei. If we have odd-odd, even-odd, or odd-even nuclei, the half-lives are even longer than predicted due to something we're going to call hindrance factors. Now, the model assumes the existence of preformed alpha particles in the nucleus, and the ground state transitions from nuclei containing odd nucleon um, can only take part if that um, odd nucleon becomes part of this emitted alpha particle. So if I think about it, if I have an odd nucleon, that means that the highest energy nucleon in that nucleus is unpaired. In order for that to become part of the alpha particle that's emitted, 
a nucleon pair has to be broken. So this um, is a pretty unfavorable situation um, because the alpha particles are already can already be formed from existing even even pairs. So this uh, gives rise to this observed hindrance. And the alpha particle uh, needs to be composed of existing pairs in such a nucleus. Uh, the product nuclei is going to be in a higher state. This can also explain why there's a high probability of transitions to excited states in the daughter nuclei. Now, the hindrance factors have been evaluated, and they're generally between 1 and 3 times 10 to the fourth. There's two ways of evaluating the hindrance factors. They're listed here. One, we can make a ratio of the measured alpha decay half-life or the calculated alpha decay half-life. Or the converse of that is I can do a ratio of calculated alpha decay constants over measured alpha decay constants. Either way, I'll get this, I'll get the same hindrance factor. This is because, um, well, there's a relationship between the decay constant and the half-life or log two divided by the half-life is equal to the decay constant. But this is an important equation to remember and use this to determine the hindrance factors. And it doesn't matter if I take the ratio of the alpha decays or the ratio of the decay constants. What you should remember is that the, that the values are going to be greater than one. So if you, use, if you use an equation and you make a calculation and the hindrance factor is below one, chances are all you need to do is take the inverse of that. Now, why we can calculate these hindrance factors, they're actually available in the uh, table of the isotopes. As an example, let's look at the transition of americium-241 to the neptunium-237 via alpha decay. Here's the data in the chart of the nuclides. We get the half-life of the americium-241, its spin and parity, the Q value, and then a bunch of these numbers that are listed here. And these are our hindrance factors. So um, states of neptunium-237 that are in the 5 halves plus ground state and 7 halves plus the first excited state have hindrance factors of about 500. And you can see those values listed right over here. So we can say that this is in a particularly uh, favored transition. However, the americium-241 sits in a 5 halves minus state right there. And if we see that there's a 5 halves minus state right here, the main transitions go from that 5 halves minus state in the parent to the 5 halves minus state in the daughter. And these are practically unhind unhind unhindered transitions. We see the hindrance factor is just barely over 1. And the reason for that has to do with the similarities between the spin and parity states of the parent and the daughter. They're, the spin's the same, the parity is the same, so there's no hindrance. We see that the ground state, the spin is the same, but there has to be a parity flip, so that's going to increase the hindrance. And as we can see, the values can go anywhere from 1 for a hindrance factor to thousands. And as we see again, this relationship is driven, this spin and parity state from the parent to the daughter being the same is manifest by a low hindrance factor. So we should be able to uh, evaluate something about changes in spin and parity as it relates to hindrance factors. And this is exactly what we see is that there's five classes of hindrance factor that are based upon some values. And we can describe the transitions as favored or um, less favored. If you have a hindrance factor between 1 and 4, the transition is a favored transition. So the emitted alpha particle is from two low-lying pairs of nucleons. Hindrance factors between 4 and 10 indicate a mixing or favorable overlap between initial and final nuclear states. 10 and 100 usually means that the spins um, of the, uh, the initial and final states are going to be the same, but the wave function overlap is not favorable. Higher factors indicate that a change in parity is going to um, occur, but with projections of the initial and final state being parallel and hindrance factors of 1,000 
were great, greater, indicate that the transition involves a parity, change, and a spin flip. So the more fundamentally from this information, hindrance factors go up when changes from the parent to the daughter become more involved in terms of having to change spin or having to change parity. There's probability of emitting other particles than alpha particles from the nucleus. These are generally much less probability. However, they can be observed. An example is carbon emission. Now, one would think that carbon-12 would be emitted from the nuclei. You can think of it as a multiple or three uh, alpha particles together. And if you were to look at the radon, excuse me, the radium uh, isotopes, they could decay towards doubly magic lead 208 through a carbon-12 emission. Now, by inspection of the table of the isotopes, you can look at uh, radium um, 222 and radium 223, and you'll see that there's a small branch of carbon-14 emission. This, um, the reason that there's a bit of a neutron excess, excess is this favors uh, emission from neutron-rich light products. Um, now, this emission probability, if you look at the table of the isotope data, is extremely small compared to alpha emission. This barrier model that we discussed, however, can be applied, except uh, the only difference bet between alpha particles and uh, carbon nuclei would be their mass. And also, if you think about the probability of the preformation of a carbon-14 residual inside of a heavy nucleus, is also small. So that's why we get very small um, probabilities. The simplest example of a positive charged particle decay is the proton decay. We've explored the alpha particle, which is the most common. We, we discussed heart larger charged particles, such as carbon isotopes. And now let's just focus in a little bit on the simplest charged particle, which would be a proton decay. So for uh, proton-rich nuclei, they have a Q value uh, that can be positive for proton emission. And if we look at the chart of the nuclides here, the expanded version of the mass number versus the atomic number, we know that there's boundaries. And at this boundary, you'd find the proton drip line. So these are going to be proton-rich nuclei. On the other side, you'll find a neutron drip line, same sort of property where the neutron just kind of falls off. And these are obviously neutron-rich nuclei. So we've got this proton drip line. Um, where the Q value is positive. And this can also be used to explore an under and enhance understanding of how the uh, proton stays within the nucleus. The decay theory of proton decay can be similar to alpha decay. However, there's no preformation factor for a proton, right? For the alpha particle, we need to have two protons, two neutrons get together. For the proton, with well, the proton's just sitting there. Um, and now, uh, but the other difference is that proton energies, <clears throat> even for heavy nuclei, are relatively low, 1 to 2 MeV. So this means that the barriers are pretty large, um, and the probability of penetrating those barriers generally low. We need to go to some pretty exotic areas of the chart of the nuclides to explore these decays. And here's an example of some low Z elements, uh, low Z elements with their isotopes that decay by proton emission. If we look at fluorine, fluorine 15, 16, oxygen, right? Oxygen 12 has two proton decay. 13, there's a probability of this proton decay. Nitrogen 10, there's proton decay. Nitrogen 11, proton decay. Carbon 8, has a proton decay, and then there's a probability for carbon-9. So these are all very proton-rich, nitrogen-deficient isotopes that can undergo this decay. And you can find where they're located by exploring your chart of the nuclides and looking for that proton decay symbol, either two-proton or single-proton decay. In this lecture, we reviewed alpha decay. And we explored uh, the systematics between energetics and alpha decay. The key of trying to understand alpha decay and some properties of the nucleus is really correlating energy decay with observations. 
some of the things that were observed that we discussed was the correlation between half-life and Q value. Those decays that have a higher Q value, higher energy, tend to have a shorter half-life. And then we, were, we demonstrated how we could calculate Q value for alpha decay. There was also an understanding that the Q value is the entire energy of the system, and the alpha decay, the energy of the alpha particle, takes away most of the energy, but there is also some recoil that goes to the daughter. And one thing that should be pointed out, this recoil energy to the daughter can be on the order of kiloelectron volts, KeV, and if you remember that bond energies are generally measured in the order of EV, this can be enough energy for the daughter to break bonds, and this actually occurs. Um, there was also a discussion on fine structure and alpha decay. In other words, alphas often just don't produce one alpha energy. There are different alpha energies, and that has to do with the decay of the parent to the daughter ground state and excited states in the daughter. Those are often uh, accompanied by gamma decays. And we'll discuss this more when we discuss gamma decay in the course. Now we went over a few models for alpha decay, and what's important to dis it's not so much the models, the utilization models, but understanding the trends in the models and how they were derived. Um, some of the trends that are observed is that you know alpha particles at higher energy impinge upon the barrier more frequently. This is due to the fact they have a higher energy. If you use one half mv squared, their velocity must be greater if they're at higher energy. Also, if they're at a higher energy, the barrier that they have to penetrate is smaller, so there's a higher probability of that particle penetrating the barrier. And we also talked about the preformation factor, that an alpha particle may not always be sitting in the nucleus, that it needs to be formed in the nucleus and then impinge upon the barrier. So this can account for some of the, de the delays that one sees from the, between the model and the observations particularly for non-even-even -even nuclei. We talked about tunneling and potentials. So it's an application of the tunneling phenomena where the particle, the alpha particle in this case, needs to overcome a barrier, and it overcomes that barrier not by going over it, but by tunneling through it. Of course, this counts for very long half-lives, and this also accounts for the large range of half-lives that can be observed for alpha decay. We described some of this hindrance and some of these uh, behaviors uh, through the term the hindrance of alpha decay, which is basically a difference between the model and the observation. The larger that difference, the ratio, the more hindered that decay is, and we can describe that hindrance through a number of phenomena, including changes of spin and parity. And we'll see this is even more manifest for beta decay. We also touched upon other charged particle decay, including proton emission and carbon emission, including carbon-12 and carbon-14. Examples of questions you should be able to answer based upon the lecture are provided here. One has to do with uh, alpha decay energies from decay. An example with thorium-228, why does thorium-228 exhibit multiple alpha decay energies? This was discussed in the lecture. This is another thorium-228 uh, decay scheme that's shown. Here's the parent, thorium-228, decaying to the daughter, radium-224. And we see that it decays to multiple levels in the radium-224. 28.2% of the time, it goes to this first excited state. And then 71.1% of the time, it travels to the ground state. The alpha decay energy for this ground state is different by 84.3 keV from this first excited state, and they'll show up as different peaks for the alpha decay energy. So that's why we get this difference in the alpha decay energies, because the alpha decay goes to different states in the nucleus. For an even-even nucleus, like thorium-228, we'll, we'll see, and we'll discuss this again in an example, that primarily decays to the even-even ground state of the daughter. So wrote, what are some alpha alpha decay energy ranges that can be observed? Well, the lowest energy that's observable is neodymium-144 with an alpha decay energy of 1.8 MeV. And then polonium-212M for the metastable state decays with a 
energy of 11.6 MeV. So that's a reasonable range for alpha decay energies. Generally, they're between 4 and 6 MeV. What is, the rela what is the relationship between alpha decay energy and the Q value? Well, there's a, an equation. The Q value, that's the total energy of the decay, times the mass of the daughter divided by the mass of the daughter plus the mass of the alpha decay particle is equal to the alpha decay energy. And this has to do with recoil. The daughter recoils one way and the alpha decay particle decays another route. So you can use this equation to use the Q value to determine an alpha decay energy. So imagine that we're, we want to determine the alpha decay energy for an isotope like plutonium-244. It has a Q value of 4.665 MeV. Find the alpha decay. Well, plug this value into the equation. There's our Q value. Plutonium-244, the daughter is uranium-240. So 240 divided by 240 plus 4. That's equal to 4.5 Eight, nine MeV, and if you looked in the chart of the nuclides, you would see that that is the one of the uh, alpha decay energies for plutonium-244. You would also see that there are other values that are available. Again, that has to do with decaying to excited states. So this, even this value, that's the maximum uh, alpha decay energy that can be obtained from a given Q value. Based on the results from the lecture, you should be able to discuss some general trends that are observed in alpha decay. And examples could be that uh, alpha emission is generally seen for the heaviest nuclei in the chart of the nuclides, generally with isotopes of mass greater than 210. So these are the elements above uh, lead and bismuth generally. There are some examples of alpha decaying isotopes in the lanthanides. For instance, we discussed the low energy alpha decay that is seen in neodymium 144. Um, the other trend is that the higher energy alpha decays tend to have shorter half-lives and that the um, energy of an alpha particle generally increases with the atomic number of the parents. So as we go higher and higher along uh, the periodic table or in the chart of the nuclides, we'll see that alpha decay energies generally increase. So what is the spin and parity of the daughter from a uranium-238 alpha decay? Well, we discussed this earlier. Uh, we gave an example with the thorium-228. The ground states, spins of even, even parents, daughters, and alpha decays are all zero. And they tend, so the daughter will tend to be zero plus. In fact, it will be zero plus. You go from an even, even nucleus to an even, even nuclear, even, even, even nuclei are, have a spin and parity of zero plus. How is quantum tunneling related to alpha decay? A topic that's popular in quantum mechanics. Um, we know that the alpha particle is the energy is less than the Coulomb barrier. So the somehow the alpha particle can escape from the nuclear potential with less energy than the potential itself. And this occurs by the alpha particle tunneling through a portion of the barrier. The penetration of the alpha particle, that probability is greater at higher energy, and that relates to a shorter half-life. So what's the relationship between half-life and alpha decay? Q value. Well, there's actually an equation that we talked about where the log of the half-life is equal to uh, the constant A plus B divided by the square root of the Q value for the alpha decay. A and B are functions of Z, so a function of proton number, and there's strong correlation for even even nuclei. And as we see, we generally plot, you, you could determine this these factors by plotting the log of the half-life in the same unit, generally seconds, against 1 divided by the square root of the Q value for even, even nuclei uh, of a given Z. So you can do it for uranium and plutonium, thorium, and achieve these relationships that will give you, um, you'll be able to determine uh, the factors for A and B, and you'll be able to determine the uh, alpha decay half-life for isotopes that are theoretical or have half-lives that are long enough where other routes, such as spontaneous fission or perhaps beta decay, compete.
based upon the lecture, one should be able to answer some questions on the Coulomb barrier, such as what is the generalized equation to find the Coulomb barrier. The generalized equation is shown here, where nucleus 1, nucleus 2, those values for the z are multiplied together and divided by 1.2 times uh, the a to the one-third plus uh, a to the one-third for nucleus 1 and nucleus 2, and that's multiplied by 1.44 MeV. We'll see in other examples of the Q, uh, for Coulomb barrier that this equation can vary a little bit, um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, what nuclei were evaluated to derive the equation. And if we make this specific for alpha decay, we can substitute for Z1, we can substitute 2, and for A1, we can substitute 4. So for an alpha decay, you would be looking at the Coulomb barrier from the alpha decay, and Z2 would be uh, the daughter, and A2 would be the A for the daughter. We could use this equation to compare the Coulomb barrier for the alpha decay of plutonium-228, plutonium-244, that's a long range of the same isotope, and then curium-244, so comparing the same A but different Z. And what we get for the Coulomb barrier for plutonium-228 is 28.8 MeV. If we just add neutrons, so we go from 228 to 244, we're fundamentally diluting the charge, so the Coulomb barrier goes down, and as we see, it goes from 28.8 MeV and lose about half an MeV to 28.3 MeV. Now, if we take 244 nucleons, but we convert more of those from neutrons to protons, we're increasing the charge, and we the Coulomb barrier should go up. And indeed, from this equation, we see that it goes up from 28.3 MeV to 28.9 MeV. Then a final a question you should be able to answer based on the lecture includes, what is alpha decay hindrance factor? Um, Alpha decay half-lives uh, tend to be longer than expected based upon models developed for even-even isotopes. So this hindrance factor is that ratio of the, either the measured alpha decay half-life divided by the calculated half-life, so this is greater than 1, or the decay constant that's calculated divided by the decay constant that's measured. These are greater, these, this is also greater than 1. So you can use either the decay constant or the half-life, again, to make sure the half-life units are the same or the decay constant units are the same. And you should always remember that the hindrance factor is one or greater. There's other questions that you should be able to answer that we're not going to give examples on. For example, with other charged particle decay that use similar models to alpha decay, fundamentally proton decay, which occurs with the proton dip, drip line or other charged particle decay, such as carbon-12 or carbon-14. When you've completed this lecture, please respond to the quiz for Lecture 4 and comment on the blog.